Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan. By the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment. And by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible in part by Pfizer. So today I want to talk about Earth's changing climate and uh, ask the question, what's in store for the future? And probably no other scientific topic has been more in the news over the last decade or even two decades than climate change. Uh, we hear about it on a more or less regular drumbeat. And in the last few months, we have heard even more as the uh, reports of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, have been uh, being released uh, volume by volume. Let me tell you a little about the IPCC. It's a, an entity created about uh, 25 years ago uh, by the United Nations and the World Meteorological Organization. And it was charged with presenting an assessment of climate and climate change uh, on about a five-yearly interval and to apprise the decision makers uh, of the world as to what, what was happening with our climate. And the new report, uh, this time after six years, uh, has just been coming out. The first volume came out in February. This was the scientific basis. The second volume came out last week on uh, the consequences and the uh, adaptations that the Earth is facing. And the third volume on, on policy issues are uh, yet, to be, yet to be published. It'll come out in August. But the IPCC is a, uh, I would say that their reports are extremely comprehensive and at the same time extremely conservative. The, the reason for the conservatism, or the comprehensiveness first, is that uh, they have engaged climate scientists from all over the globe, uh, something like uh, 400 lead authors, another 800 contributing authors, and then the initial drafts of their reports go out for scientific review and there were more than 2,500 additional scientific reviewers that send back comments and criticisms to which the authors have to respond and make all, uh, adjustments if necessary. Then it goes back out to 130 government panels for review. Governments get to say what they like and don't like about it, write critiques, and the authors then have to face that and adjust uh, to, to those comments. And then finally, uh, out comes one report. And it's a, it's a massive report coming out in three volumes. It's uh, probably 1,500 pages in total. And it is a very definitive statement about climate and about consequences and about uh, policy options. And I say it's conservative because it has to meet so many critics, so many commentaries, uh, and respond to it that uh, it, I would, would never say it's watered down, because it's not. It's a very strong document. But its conclusions are all uh, designed to, uh, in a sense, uh, meet the harshest of criticisms. And so it's uh, something that has been extremely well vetted. Now, in addressing climate change, uh, I like to frame the debate uh, in terms of what I call the four central questions. Uh, is the climate changing? What's the evidence for climate change? Uh, if it is changing, what's causing it? What will be the consequences? And what should we be doing about it? And the, the first three are largely scientific topics. And uh, the fourth has some science and some social science, politics, economics, uh, and such as that. 
And I want to try and walk us through uh, these four questions today and uh, give you the, this overview. So the first question, is the climate changing? The, the fundamental set of data that uh, we rely upon are readings of weather stations around the globe, of uh, ships taking temperature measurements of the sea surface, of uh, buoyed observatories in the oceans, of satellites looking down at the Earth's surface. Uh, we call this the instrumental record. And when you compile this data from all over the globe uh, over the past 120 or 140 years, you get a, a graph like this, which shows the, the uh, global average temperature uh, uh, going up and down year by year. And the overall change uh, in the uh, little more than a century that's shown here is about uh, one degree Celsius. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see. I could have left the red line off of that, but the general trend is up. And this is the, the fundamental evidence that the, the Earth is warming. Now, to be sure, there's year-by-year -year variation. Uh, there's, uh, it's not at a uniform trend upwards. But nevertheless, the long-term trend uh, is, is definitely up. And it's not only the, the temperature of the atmosphere that has been increasing. Uh, the temperature of the oceans uh, has been growing as well, not just at its surface, but at depth as the ocean mixes. Uh, the oceans have warmed noticeably down to uh, about three kilometers of depth already. And in my own work, uh, the, would, I take the temperature of, of the rocks beneath the surface. Uh, Greg has uh, mentioned a little of that. And uh, we too can see climate change because as the air temperature changes, the rocks underneath feel it and they change too. And by our measurements of rock temperatures, uh, we're able to reconstruct what has happened in the past. And all of this type of evidence is very, very consistent. Uh, it is telling the same story uh, from a, a wide number of different types of observations, and the scientists feel very confident about the instrumental record. But if you don't like thermometers, if you don't like to uh, trust instruments, uh, nature has its own thermometers. And nature's best thermometer, in my mind, is ice. Because when ice gets too warm, it melts. It, it doesn't consult anybody. It just melts. <laughs> and as you look around the world at ice, uh, you can see evidence of this. I'll take you on a little field trip here to the Alps. This is a, a picture of the Rhone Glacier in 1850. And I want to just point out a little bit of the uh, geography here. Uh, the Rhone Glacier comes from up on the plateau here. It flows down a slope, spread out in a big lobe down in the valley. And it's been a tourist destination site for a long time. There's this road, this little zigzag road that uh, brings you down into the valley. And here are some tourists uh, walking at the foot of the glacier. Well, that's in 1850. Now, up on the, the side of the valley, uh, a little bit later, there is a famous hotel built just about here called the Hotel Belvedere. And here in a, a picture from 1906, this is actually a postcard, uh, the Hotel Belvedere up on, on the roadside, you can see the ice uh, in the upper valley and going down the slope and spreading out in that big lobe. Now, in 1927, this is the Rhone Glacier. The tongue of ice that has come down the slope is still there. There is the Hotel Belvedere uh, up there. But the big globe in the valley has now melted away. And in 1981, uh, this is a picture. Here's the Hotel Belvedere still. Uh, the tongue is nearly all gone. Uh, the ice is still in the upper valley. And another shot from the Hotel Belvedere. Uh, in a modern scene, uh, the ice is now even further back. Now, this is not something that is just peculiar to the Alps or the Rhone Glacier. Uh, it's happening to glaciers all over the world. And I'll give you a, a little quick tour. This is a picture of the McBride Glacier in Glacier, Na uh, Glacier Bay National Park in Alaska. And this picture was taken in 1988. 
And in 1966, the ice was all the way up here. This is a, a moraine of the glacier that was formed uh, in 1966. So in 22 years, uh, there's been uh, that retreat of the McBride Glacier and every other glacier in Glacier Bay National Park. Um, the picture here is taken a long way away. This is in the, the Beagle Channel uh, in the southern tip of South America. And uh, when Charles Darwin sailed through here on his uh, famous ship, the Beagle, his, his book, The Voyage of the Beagle, talks about all the icebergs in the Beagle Channel and how the glaciers coming down from the, the uh, South Patagonia ice field were draping over the wall of the uh, channel and breaking off, giving tidewater glaciers. And uh, today, of course, you look at that and it's way back up on the hillside. All of this, which Darwin saw as ice, uh, is today empty. In Africa, on Kilimanjaro, here's two photos, uh, one in 1978, one in 2005. You can see visually the loss of snow and ice. But there's a graph here uh, on the 1978 photo that shows the, de the decrease in the amount of area of ice on Kilimanjaro over about a century. And there's no mistaking the trend here. It's down, 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 down. The 2005 measurement right here, shown here, and a projection that in another decade or so, uh, it's all going to be gone. The famous snows of Kilimanjaro uh, will have disappeared. Now, disappearing with all these mountain glaciers are, of course, uh, scientific archives, because the glaciers themselves uh, give us a lot of history. I'm not going to go into that, but uh, it gives us a history of uh, sometimes several thousand years of ice accumulation, uh, which can be translated into uh, a climate story. Now, it's not just mountain glaciers uh, that are losing ice, but uh, the frozen seawater in the Arctic Ocean, the sea ice, uh, has been diminishing also. Every summer, the Arctic Ocean uh, undergoes uh, some melting, but the amount of melting and the subsequent refreezing uh, is leading to a diminished amount of sea ice in the Arctic. Uh, there's been a, a 15 to 20 percent decrease in area and a 50 percent decrease in thickness of the Arctic sea ice uh, in the last uh, half century. And that trend is continuing, and if it uh, continues, Another half century or so, we'll see an ice-free Arctic Ocean in the summertime. On Greenland, uh, we see here uh, three pictures of Greenland over uh, three different years, all fairly recent. And the orange shows you those regions of Greenland that are undergoing summertime melting uh, every uh, northern hemisphere summer. And the picture that you can see, of course, is that the amount of uh, Greenland that undergoes summertime melting is increasing. Some of that melt runs off into the sea. Some of it will refreeze in the winter. But in general, the, the area of Greenland covered by ice is slowly uh, diminishing. And what about at the other end of the uh, globe, in the southern high latitudes? There was a a prophecy made, I shouldn't say prophecy, maybe prediction is better, uh, about uh, almost 30 years ago, that said that if you see the ice shelves on both coasts of the Antarctic Peninsula breaking up, that'll be a signal that there's a, uh, a dangerous warming trend. This was by John Mercer uh, in 1978. Well, let's see what's been happening. This is a picture of Antarctica. And the, this is the region called the Antarctic Peninsula. And there are ice shelves all along the edge of it. And since about the year 2000, uh, it's been breaking away. I'll show you some pictures in a moment. And on the other side of Antarctica, this is the Ross Ice Shelf. And that, too, has been undergoing uh, some uh, disintegration. Let's see what that looks like. For the 
Uh, Antarctic Peninsula, the uh, most recent loss of ice shelf was something called the Larsen B ice shelf, and it uh, totally uh, collapsed, and that ice uh, is moving out to sea. There's still quite a bit of it floating around the Antarctic. It takes a while for it all to be uh, distributed. But uh, the Larsen B ice shelf, in a period of time of a little over a month, uh, went from a much bigger area to this, this big gap in it that you see. Uh, this is an area that broke up is about the size of the state of Rhode Island uh, in, in one big collapse of the ice shelf. The Ross ice shelf on the other side of uh, Antarctica, this big piece broke off uh, about five years ago and uh, has since broken up into two or three big pieces, but it's still uh, uh, a navigational challenge in the Ross Sea. There's all kinds of additional uh, types of evidence, some related to freezing, uh, others not. Flowers are blooming uh, earlier in the spring. Uh, birds are laying their eggs earlier. Uh, tundra travel days in Alaska, when you can only move across the tundra when it's frozen, has diminished from 200 days a year to 100 days a year in, in just two decades. Uh, rivers are freezing later in the fall and, and melting earlier in the spring. The evidence just comes from all sorts of uh, observations, both instrumental and natural. It led the IPCC to reach this conclusion, that warming of the climate system is unequivocal. Let's not debate that any longer. It is happening. So we want to now ask, what are the causes of climate change? Now, every res responsible climate scientist will tell you that there are all kinds of things that affect climate, and we, we have to understand and identify at any given time what is causing climate change uh, at that moment. And there are some things that we classify as natural, meaning they're, they're not man-made, uh, and included in that are variations in the amount of radiation we get from the sun. Uh, we've been very uh, uh, busy monitoring that ever since we've had satellites up above the atmosphere uh, with uh, radiometers and spectrometers that are recording solar variability across the full spectrum of the solar radiation. Uh, there's volcanic activity. Volcanoes put a large amount of ash into the atmosphere, which temporarily clouds uh, the atmosphere, makes it more obscure or less transparent, and stops some incoming uh, solar uh, radiation from reaching Earth. <coughs> and then there's internal variability, where uh, this is largely in the oceans, where there are uh, periodic overturns, uh, various oscillations such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation, uh, and the NAO is the North Atlantic Oscillation. I'll not go into details, but these are sometimes, uh, certainly multi-year, but sometimes even multi-decadal oscillations that uh, will uh, put an overprint on uh, the solar and, and volcanic forcing. Now, on the other hand, uh, we have what are called anthropogenic uh, forcings, uh, and I list here three, the principal ones. Uh, changes in land use uh, lead to uh, changes in the reflectivity of the Earth, how much of the sunshine is bounced back to space versus how much is absorbed at the surface. It changes the carbon cycle uh, because if you deforest a region, you cut down the trees, they are no longer pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere uh, due to photosynthetic activity. So, Land use change, uh, and uh, it's, humans are, of course, behind that, uh, are uh, a, a big player. There's also uh, aerosols. These are, are uh, small particles uh, that are in, uh, emitted into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels. And biomass, they are a similar in effect to volcanic activity in that they generally block a little bit of sunshine from reaching uh, the Earth's surface. And then last are the greenhouse gases, uh, which uh, are absorbers of energy that's trying to re, uh, be re-radiated from the Earth's surface. And they get trapped in the lower atmosphere and absorbed, and the lower atmosphere warms because of that. So they sometimes are called heat-trapping gases, uh, and they uh, are the biggest player of all. The sun is not a constant radiator, despite the fact that 
you think it might be, and we even talk about things like the solar constant. In fact, the sun does have fluctuations in its radiation, and we, we are aware of it, people study it, and uh, we know how, how much is happening. Uh, in the case of volcanic eruptions, there's a, uh, a volcano sending uh, billows of ash into the atmosphere. It gets redistributed by the atmospheric circulation, and it uh, temporarily blocks sunshine uh, from reaching uh, the surface of the Earth. Uh, the year 1815 was the year of the big eruption of Tambora in Indonesia. And the year 1816, following that, was known worldwide as the year without a summer. Uh, that so much sunshine was blocked that uh, disrupted climate, uh, disrupted crop uh, plantings. It snowed in upstate New York on the 4th of July. Uh, it was a bad year in 1816. And it lingered on, of course, uh, from that big eruption for several years after. Now on the, as an example, here's a picture of land use change uh, from deforestation. You can immediately see that the dark forest, which absorbs uh, carbon dioxide, has been replaced by open field, uh, which is much lighter in color, has a different reflection coefficient, a different albedo. And that is taking place in, in parts of Brazil, in Indonesia, Madagascar, where deforestation is a, a, big, uh, a big operation. The atmospheric aerosols, uh, we tend to call it smog if we're in the middle of it. Uh, and it certainly does impede the, uh, the uh, arrival of solar energy at the Earth's surface. Uh, a haze that's coming in from Mexico and Guatemala uh, due to forest burning, uh, clearing of uh, forest area for agriculture and casting a big haze. This will get distributed around the globe. This is a famous graph. This is a graph of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, the axis here is in the concentration of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere in parts per million. And it started in 1957 uh, when uh, Charles Keeling, at that time just a graduate student, but, but later had a very distinguished academic career, started making these observations on the top of uh, Mauna Loa in Hawaii. And those observations have continued to the present day and they, of course, have been made at many other places around the world. And because the atmosphere is so well mixed, we're discovering that what we've learned on Mauna Loa is very uh, characteristic of what we're learning everywhere else, uh, anywhere from Alaska uh, to Africa to the South Pole. Observatories are showing the same pattern. And although there's an annual oscillation that has to do with the uh, waxing and waning of northern hemisphere ve uh, vegetation and its take up of carbon dioxide in photosynthetic activity in the summertime, uh, the long-term trend here is up, up, up. And the present day uh, uh, concentrations are uh, getting up towards 380 parts per million. Uh, when this observation started, there are 315 parts per million. They're increasing at about two parts per million every year presently. Now, looking back in time, we want to get a, a, a flavor or a feeling for how this compares to earlier times. And we can extend this backward uh, into the period of time uh, over which we have our instrumental record, the weather station record of temperatures. And the blue line on this graph takes it back to 1860. The yellow line is what we just looked at in Mauna Loa. And the blue line comes from examining little bubbles of atmosphere that have been trapped in, in ice as snow falls and it gets compressed and compacted into ice. It traps little bubbles of the atmosphere and you can get a sample of the atmosphere at that time. And so we were able to reconstruct carbon dioxide uh, values back in time. And you can see that the, the uh, in 1860, it was at 290 parts per million. Uh, if you go back to pre-industrial levels, meaning uh, the middle of the 18th century, uh, it's back around 280, and we call that the pre-industrial level. And it's a reference level to compare what humans have added uh, from the, the burning of uh, carbon-based fuels. A really long-term uh, look at the 
history of carbon dioxide comes from ice cores in Antarctica, where they have been drilled down to depths of almost four kilometers in the uh, polar ice pack uh, high up on Antarctica. And we've been able to reconstruct carbon dioxide variation and temperature variation back several hundred thousand years. Currently, about 650,000, uh, and soon probably back to about a million years. And the picture we get, this is only for 350,000 years, but it tells the story, uh, is shown. Uh, there's two graphs here. The green one is carbon dioxide, and the blue one is the temperature uh, of, at which the snow that was converted to ice was precipitated at. And I want to focus on the green line first uh, because the pre-industrial level of 280 uh, turns out to be very similar to the green peaks that you see there. Uh, sometimes it's a little uh, more than 280, maybe as much as 300. But over several hundred thousand years, and as I say, almost back to a million now with modern data, We've never seen carbon dioxide in the atmosphere higher than 300 parts per million. And today, the red line, which is that record I just showed you, is already up to 380 and climbing at two parts per million every year. Our carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere is out of the range that natural variability has given us for the past million years. We are embarked on an unusual experiment with our carbon cycle and our climate that we don't know fully the outcome of yet, but we're beginning to see the consequences. The blue line shows the temperature variation that uh, has been uh, deduced from the chemistry of the uh, hydrogen and the oxygen. This is through isotopic ratios that are a function of temperature. And uh, you can see that the, the temperature variations and the greenhouse gas variations march together. And it's not important whether one leads or the other leads. The main point is that when one gets out of kilter, the other will follow. And we're, we're seeing in the red line on that graph a, a great deviation from the normal bounds uh, that uh, the greenhouse gas and temperature partnership has experienced in the last several hundred thousand years. Now, what are the cycles that you see here? Well, they're about 100,000 years long. These are the ice ages. These are the, the ice ages of the recent past. We probably had 20 of them over the last two or three million years. But these are the, just the last uh, three cycles. And the blue line here at uh, 20,000 years ago, uh, at that time, there, were, there was ice over Ann Arbor. This was glaciated. Ice went all the way down to the Ohio River. And uh, we came out of the last ice age. The temperatures rose to where we are today. Uh, it's about uh, uh, 8 to 10 degrees warmer here than it was uh, 20,000 years ago. And you can see 120,000 years ago, there was another warm period. Uh, around 240,000 years ago, another warm period and another warm period and then descend into ice age, into ice age, into ice age. So you can see natural cycles at work here, but they're very long period. All right, what is the IPCC made of these uh, uh, examinations of the forcing factors, the solar variation, the volcanic eruptions, the greenhouse gases, the anthropogenic aerosols? What what is the assessment of their relative importance? Well, the, the way that the IPCC uh, deals with this is that they take climate models. These are large computer models that have the equations of atmospheric and oceanic circulation and uh, heating from the various forcing factors, volcanics, uh, solar variations that we have been able to uh, determine. And you plug them all in and you examine them to see uh, which, if any, will yield a, a history of temperature that we have observed over the past uh, 120 to 140 years. 
So that's what this graph is like. And it's a complicated graph, but I want to uh, walk you through it. It's basically a graph of temperature change uh, over uh, the last 120 years or so. And let's focus initially just on the blue, blue line with the blue shading. That's what the climate would look like if you drove it only with solar variations and volcanic eruptions. In fact, in the last half of the 20th century, the solar output declined slightly, and there were more than an average number of volcanic eruptions. Uh, we had Mount Pinatubo in 92. We had uh, uh, El Chichon in Mexico in, in the 80s. We had Agung in Indonesia uh, in the 60s. And those uh, led to uh, these particular low peaks here, but it along with the solar variation, it dragged down what we would expect for the climate uh, if it was only being driven by natural factors. But if you add in the human factors, the anthropogenic factors, the greenhouse gases, the aerosols, the land use changes, then you get the red pattern. And you can see that is going up. The actual observations that's the weather station record that I showed you earlier with the sea surface temperatures and the global data is black. And in the early part of the century, you can't say that uh, one is more important than the other in terms of natural and uh, anthropogenic. But in the latter half of the century, the natural would be tending downward, and the anthropogenic upward, and the temperatures, the real temperatures of the globe, are going up. So we conclude that, that indeed the greenhouse gases are the most important factor, or the human uh, forcings are the most important factor in the last uh, 50 years, and continuing to grow. Now, it's not just the temperatures that uh, support this, but if you look up upward at the vertical structure of temperature in the atmosphere, uh, you find that the lower atmosphere, the troposphere, is warming quite strongly, but that the stratosphere above it is cooling. And that is an indirect signature of the fact that heat that might be getting to the stratosphere is being trapped by greenhouse gases in the troposphere, and so the stratosphere is not getting its warming of the radiation leaving uh, the Earth because it doesn't reach the stratosphere. So, that's a, a strong uh, secondary indicator that indeed the greenhouse gases are the, the principal uh, component. Well, the IPCC has uh, had a uh, differing view over the years about what is the role of the human forcing? What is the anthropogenic contribution? In 1990, you couldn't, you couldn't say for sure that the greenhouse effect uh, was definitely behind it. In 1995, it was a little more nuanced statement. It said balance of evidence suggests there's a discernible human influence. In 2001, new and stronger evidence that most of the warming over the past half century is due to human activities. 2007, the one that came out in February, said that it's very likely, with nine chances out of 10 being true, that the anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations are causing the increase in temperature. All right, what are the consequences of climate change? Well, the first consequence is that the planet's getting warmer. And this, uh, this has, uh, this is just a uh, observational fact, uh, and I'll talk more about what a warmer planet will mean. Uh, we also uh, have observed that sea level is rising, in part because we're melting ice that's running off into the ocean, but in part because the ocean water is getting warmer and undergoing thermal expansion, and that uh, makes it occupy a greater volume. We uh, have seen that there are more, or at least more intense, extreme weather events, uh, such as hurricanes, floods, and droughts. There have been effects in the uh, natural biota of the globe where things that were comfortable living in one region are now on the move to areas that are 
more uh, attuned to their climate. And lastly, the ocean is getting more acidic. Uh, as more carbon dioxide is being taken up by the oceans, dissolved in the oceans, it creates a weak acid, carbonic acid, and the pH of the oceans has been falling uh, for the uh, last several decades. Well, let's take a look at each of these briefly. This is a comparison of the average temperature of the last five years, roughly the last five years, compared to the average temperature over uh, three decades uh, beginning in the mid-20th century. And you can see that, by and large, everything's warming up. It's not to say everything is warming equally, however. Some regions are warming more than average, some less than average, some average, and some are actually cooling. Uh, some regions in the southern ocean uh, have shown some cooling. Now, this will continue from all we can tell, and it's going to be at the end of the, 20, uh, uh, the 21st century, end of our current century, uh, temperatures are going to be another uh, almost two to upwards of four degrees Celsius higher on average uh, over the globe. And uh, the implications of this, number one for mountain glaciers, is that they'll be gone. Uh, mountain glaciers uh, in, in our own Glacier National Park, we should rename it as the former Glacier National Park. Uh, Kilimanjaro's ice will be gone. Uh, most of the, well, virtually all of the mountain glaciers uh, on Earth will have lost their ice. And what this means, it's, it has a dramatic consequence because glacial uh, melting has been a water supply for about a sixth of Earth's population uh, for as long as humans have been on Earth. Uh, people who live at the foot of the uh, Himalaya, at the foot of the Andes, uh, in, in uh, the uh, northern, uh, northern parts of Italy, at the foot of the Alps, all of these depend very much on glacial uh, meltwater as a water supply. That will disappear and put great stress, water stress, on about a sixth of the Earth's population, about one billion people. Now, closer to home, this is a, a likely projection of what Michigan's climate will be like uh, a century from now. Uh, in winter, we'll be more like uh, southern Ohio, northern Kentucky. And in summer, southern Missouri, northern Arkansas. So uh, we'll still be the Great Lakes state, but it'll be Arkansas north. Uh, <laughs> by the, just a couple of years ago, in 2003, when there was a tremendous heat wave in Europe. Some of you were probably uh, traveling in Europe at the time, sweating. And uh, here, uh, the estimate was that more than 11,000 people died from the heat in, in France and upwards of 40,000 throughout Europe. So what about higher sea levels? Another major consequence. Uh, the higher sea levels are already happening. Uh, here's a, a graph of sea level at Key West, Florida. Uh, over the 20th century, and again, there's a, a lot of uh, variability to it, but you don't need uh, a regression line to tell you that generally sea level is going up at Key West, and uh, about uh, oh, something like uh, 10 to 20 centimeters. In terms of the future, the IPCC has done a number of projections, and I'll show you some. Uh, these are model-based projections. I just want to summarize this graph in saying that it goes through a lot of different scenarios, which I'll mention in a second, and it shows you a range of possibilities of sea level change. But all of these, over the century, are less than one meter or 100 centimeters. In other words, this is the full range of projections. The different scenarios, of course, depend on what happens in the 21st century. How many people are going to be living? How much, what kinds of energy are they going to use? Uh, how integrated will the global economy be? So if you have a, uh, a fossil fuel dependent world for the next century, you're going to get a lot more sea level rise. If you have renewable energy replacements quickly in the early part of the, uh, this century, then you get a, a lesser rise. So all the different uh, colored lines represent what I call uh, the, the non-scientific part of the uncertainty, 
This is the uncertainty in demographics and economics and politics and uh, energy development. And it's, it's not uncertainty due to climate science, it's uncertainty due to social science. And so, but as I say, all of these are predicting less than a meter of sea level rise. Now, what does a meter mean? Well, here's a uh, picture of what Florida would look like uh, with a meter rise in sea level. Everything that's red uh, would be inundated. And uh, all of the, the beachfront communities uh, are right at sea level, so they, they are the ones to go. The interior uh, stands a little bit higher, albeit uh, not much. There's places, island, island nations, both in the Pacific and Indian Ocean. This is uh, the principal city of the Maldive Islands. Uh, there's not a, any part of it that's higher than eight feet above sea level. Uh, most of it is within uh, three or four feet, and that's what a meter sea level rise would do. And this place is greatly imperiled. And this is a statement to the United Nations made by their representative. It's hard for someone in the USA to appreciate that if sea level rises a few feet, a whole nation will disappear. But the IPCC estimates of sea level, as I said, are model estimates that involve only meltwater and thermal expansion. And in recent, in the last several months or a year, there's been a new card playing into the, uh, into the sea level story. And that is that things just don't go bit by bit, a little bit more melting, a little bit more water, a little bit more thermal expansion. But there's been wholesale disgorging of ice and, and changes of pace of processes. And the IPCC made a special disclaimer about this, that the model-based estimates of sea level rise exclude rapid dynamical changes in ice flow. Well, what does that mean? Well, if we go back to the Larsen B ice shelf, this is the picture of the breakup. As soon as that ice moved off of the ice shelf and out to sea, the glaciers that were feeding it accelerated. They started spilling ice, uh, more ice into the, into the uh, sea around the Antarctic. And the same thing happened in Greenland that in a recent study of the uh, pace of ice loss in Greenland, that the glaciers around Greenland are all accelerating. And they're not just melting and giving uh, you know, water to the sea, they're actually spilling fresh ice off the continent. It's like dropping an ice cube into the sea. And sea level is rising uh, uh, because of these accelerated processes. And so the worrisome thing is uh, whether that process is going to pick up steam. Now, when you look back at the Larsen Ice Shelf prior to the uh, big breakup, this was a month earlier in, in January of 2002, you'll notice all of these uh, lines here that when you get up close to those, uh, on the ground, this is what it looks like. These are cracks in the surface of the ice. Summertime melting in Greenland, uh, here you can see the meltwater is plummeting down those cracks. And in Greenland, at least, it's getting right down to beneath the ice cover. It's lubricating the bottom of the ice sheet. And the ice is moving much faster. And so there's some worry that the IPCC estimates of less than a meter uh, are likely to be very conservative and perhaps uh, uh, misleading. If we dumped a lot of ice into the water due to this rapid uh, loss of ice from both Greenland and perhaps West Antarctica over here, which is about the same size as Greenland, each of those has enough ice on them to raise sea level uh, about six meters. Now six meters, for those who don't think in the metric, it's like 20 feet of sea level. And here is a six meter inundation around the Gulf of Mexico. The red areas show you what that would encompass. Uh, you can see, of course, South Florida and the Keys uh, are in great trouble. A lot of the Caribbean islands, New Orleans, uh, already below sea level, uh, would be certainly find its dike stop all along the Yucatan. Uh, this is a, a startling uh, result, and of course, if any of you have seen uh, the movie The Inconvenient Truth, you've seen demonstrations of what six meter inundations would mean in Manhattan, uh, in Beijing, and Shanghai, uh, and such.
More importantly, it's not just land you're losing, but you're, you're displacing people. And a, a one meter rise of sea level would displace about 100 million people around the world. A six meter rise would displace about 400 million people. Uh, this is, 100 million people is more displaced people than all of World War II led to. We would call these climate refugees, uh, but it's a major disruption in the social fabric. When you think about how well the United States has dealt with 150,000 displaced people from New Orleans, uh, it doesn't bode well for dealing with 100 million uh, people. Of course, the sea level rise could come more gradually, but it also could come if a big chunk slid into the water, it could be worse. Consequences of a warm and at warmer atmosphere is that it can uh, accelerate the hydrological cycle, the atmosphere can hold more moisture, it can dump more moisture, and uh, it also it has more intense evaporation from the surface, it dries out soils at lower lake levels. But uh, here's a picture from Bombay a couple of years ago. 37 inches of rain in one day. Now, it may sound fantastic, but last week in Central Park, there was 7.8 inches of rain in one day with the nor'easter that dumped so much precipitation. The other extreme, of course, is drought. Uh, the evaporation process depletes soil moisture, and uh, droughts are uh, going to be an increasing uh, consequence as well. We've already seen Simple examples of this, a couple of years ago, a storm dumps a foot of rain in North Dakota uh, in 12 hours. A foot of rain may, well certainly it seems like a lot, and it is, but it's half the rainfall of North Dakota for an entire year in one day. And of course the, the other side of the coin, uh, increasing droughts uh, here almost three months without a drop of rain in North Texas a couple of years ago. And Australia is undergoing droughts of uh, century-long proportions. It's very uh, dramatic. And of course, the hurricane business, uh, we're just beginning to study that, but the, the research is, is showing that as sea surface temperatures go up, and that's what the graph on this uh, slide shows, that uh, the, uh, the duration and intensity of hurricanes, not necessarily the number, but the duration and intensity are going up. We've seen that already with Katrina, uh, a category five hurricane. But perhaps more impressive is the fact that in the South Atlantic, which had been hurricane free throughout history, uh, recorded its first hurricane in the year 2004. The last two have to do with wildlife and I'm running a little short of time so I want to just say that there'll be big effects on, on wildlife uh, and uh, Coincidentally, there's a new show coming on television on the Animal Planet channel starting today by the National Wildlife Federation that is called Springtime Watch USA that is going to monitor the shifting of time when different things are happening in the, in the biological world. I recommend that you uh, go for it. Well, all right, I've got just a few minutes left. So what are we going to do about it? The challenge is to Avoid the unmanageable, that's you know, six meters of sea level rise, but manage the unavoidable, which means that some climate change is going to happen, is happening, and will continue, and we have to learn to manage it. Avoiding the unmanageable calls for cutting back of our uh, tampering with the climate. Managing the unavoidable means planning uh, so that our institutions can deal with uh, the future in prudent ways. Uh, the latter, managing the unavoidable, is called adaptation. There's this brand new publication just came out uh, a couple weeks ago, authored by our dean of the School of Natural Resources, uh, Rosina Bierbaum, and Peter Raven of the Missouri Botanical Gardens. Uh, we're not getting a good leadership uh, at the top of our federal government. The White House has been particularly lagging. When, when George Bush ran for president in 2000, he said that he would include greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act, 
and that they would uh, be recognized as a pollutant and under regulation. He reneged on that within three months of coming uh, into office, and it was just uh, a month ago that the U.S. Supreme Court finally ruled in favor of uh, greenhouse gases being classified as a, a pollutant and therefore available for regulation. But the White House, uh, it said, volunteerism is wonderful. Uh, do what you want. If you feel good about it, fine. If you don't, all right, that's okay too. I thought that there might have been a change from the White House uh, five years later when President Bush made this statement, but he was talking about Social Security. <laughs> so what are the elements of a climate policy? Um, I think that, number one, there's a couple of psychological factors. You have to move beyond denial. You have to get out of the notion that, well, maybe it's happening, maybe it isn't. Let me assure you, it is happening. The consequences are not going to be pretty. So you've got to move beyond denial and give up the, idea, the wishful thinking that uh, we're not going to be rescued with a technological silver bullet. Uh, you know, but once again, the White House one year says hydrogen is going to rescue us. The next year, they say ethanol is going to rescue us. But in fact, no single item will rescue us. We need help uh, in a wide variety of ways. Uh, we need to conserve energy, not waste as much. The U.S. wastes as much energy as Japan uses. We waste as much energy as Japan uses. We need to develop uh, alternative energy uh, that is not... Uh, carbon-based. Uh, th these can uh, be, <clears throat> be <clears throat> largely solar and wind <clears throat> are two very promising ones. If we're still producing energy through carbon, we should uh, capture the carbon and sequester it. Don't let it get into the atmosphere. Uh, the next one, slowing population growth, is a matter of educating developing countries uh, about uh, the advantages of smaller uh, uh, family sizes. And, uh, and then, of course, adaptation, because we are not going to be able to forestall everything. As far as d avoiding denial, we're, we're gradually, the public is becoming aware. This is a whole series of magazine articles. Uh, if I had brought this up to date, uh, it would have included one in the Sports Illustrated a, a month ago. And the most recent Time magazine, you can see there's already two from Time magazine, also uh, is focusing on, on climate change. And uh, the what, business of no silver bullets is best illustrated here. This is the growth of, uh, of carbon emissions into the atmosphere over the next half century and, and from 1970 onward. And this is business as usual if we don't do anything. And I can rest assured, tell you that this is, uh, is a road to disaster. Uh, it is going to accelerate climate change and into uh, magnitudes that we're going to be very unhappy with. But what can we do? Well, there's this notion that we can do lots of things, no silver bullets, but uh, maybe some silver buckshot that uh, would uh, enable us. And this, this illustration shows that uh, something like seven or eight wedges of stabilization or web wedges of uh, emission reduction that can each do a piece of the, the story. Uh, there's electrical, electricity end use efficiency, uh, passenger vehicle efficiency, uh, renewable energy, carbon capture and sequestration. Each of these is a big task and we need all of them. We, we, don't, we can't hope for one of them to do everything. Uh, just to an example of the magnitude and the scale of the, of the wedges, look at it, just a few of them. Um, increased fuel economy of 500 million cars from 30 to 60 miles per gallon. This is in the next 40 years. Drive 500 million cars 5,000 fewer miles. Use ethanol for fuel for 500 million cars, but at the cost of one-sixth of all cropland going to ethanol. Uh, add 100 new nuclear power plants, increase wind power 40-fold, increase solar power 700-fold, install carbon capture and sequestration at 200 large 
coal-fired power plants. It's not that we meet it, can make a choice. We need it all. And it's a huge task. And it's time uh, that we get going. Happily, mainstream uh, corporate uh, America is joining in. This is what the landscape uh, might look like as we begin to employ alternative energies uh, and biofuels and passive solar architecture. Uh, and the Congress is uh, digging in. Uh, this graph showing legislative proposals, nothing has passed, I might add, but the Kyoto pro Protocol, uh, shown uh, in the little blue strip corresponding to the current administration, was rejected. Uh, it would have been a start, but, but clearly not an answer. The shaded area here is what we need to stabilize at something like 450 to 550 parts per million. You recall we're at 380 now. Uh, we need some drastic uh, steps. Most of what's being proposed doesn't go far enough at all. But the, the, uh, the later, uh, the lower ones here, Sanders, Boxer, and Waxman, uh, has uh, some potential to, to meet what we need to do. Well, the, as I say, corporate America is behind it. I won't go through all of this, but it's just to show that lots of companies are learning that they can save money, uh, not just do the right thing, but save money in the process. Uh, some statements from corporate executives uh, that they are making money. As uh, Immelt, the chairman of CEO of General Electric says, it's not a hobby to make people feel good, it's to make the company profitable. And uh, uh, the chairman of Walmart has uh, gotten on board and uh, doing a lot. Now, the insurance industry is one that uh, has long been aware of climate change because they pay the bills. Or if you look at the graph here of climate-related insurance losses, uh, the, it's growing. And of course, this was 2005, the huge hurricane year. But uh, there's no doubt that the uh, climate-related losses are growing, growing, and the insurance company, uh, companies have to deal with it. A quote from Warren Buffett, a uh, progressive, forward-looking thing says, we'd be crazy not to take into account climate change. Well, I want to leave you with this graph as the final statement. This is the, to emphasize again, that we're involved in a long-term, uh, unanticipated experiment with our climate. By having gone through now uh, two to three centuries of burning carbon, uh, we have changed the composition of the atmosphere dramatically and we're beginning to recognize that the consequences are uh, huge and that we have a big job in front of us. The USA has been slow to get on board. Uh, it's been foot dragging in many ways, but the USA not only has to deal with its own problems, but it has to provide the leadership to persuade the rest of the world that they too should go along with it. The climate catastrophe is an equal, equal opportunity catastrophe in that it will affect rich countries and poor countries. But if we expect the, the big energy users, both now and in the future, to uh, do climate sensitive adjustments to their practices, we have to lead the way. And so our challenge is to be leaders uh, and not stragglers. Thank you. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible in part by Pfizer.